Vulnerability fosters good emotions and mental health. Vulnerability also is a sign of courage. We become more resilient and brave when we embrace who we truly are and what we are feeling. The Vulnerable Scientist podcast is a space for scientists who are honest and authentic or are working towards it. Join the Vulnerable Space by either sending an audio using the link on the show notes talking about your highs and lows as a scientist or by contacting Sarah Jakeri, aka New Biochemist, to schedule a chat. The Vulnerable Scientist Podcast benefits both the listener and the one sharing. You can now rate this podcast on Spotify or put a review on Apple Podcasts or any other listening platform with a rating button. And to share your thoughts, feel free to send an audio message using the audio link, either using your name or anonymously, to be published on the following episodes of the Vulnerable Scientist Podcast. Are you wondering what I used to upload and store my website spaces. Host Pineapple. Host Pineapple I've been using it for over two years right now and just never disappointed me. So host your website today using Host Pineapple cheap and affordable and reliable services. To start experiencing Host Pineapple goodness, click on the link on the show notes and you will not regret your decision. Dr. Elizabeth Kimani Murage, and I'm a senior research scientist at the African Population and Health Research Center. I lead work on maternal and child well-being, and particularly maternal and child nutrition. But more recently, I have been more, quite involved in the area of uh, food. So I'm promoting the right to food. I grew up in, uh, in Kiambu, District, then it was called district, but now it's called Kiambu County. And um, I, I grew up in a, in a modest Christian family. And uh, we, uh, we, we did some bit of farming, uh, subsistence farming. I, I remember that because I was very, I mean, of course we were involved in that farming and I also, my mom used to give me a small part of the land, small portion of the land for my own family. And um, we, we grew food first to feed ourselves. And then we also shared with people around us in the community. And then we also, uh, we also sold whatever was excess. And um, so my family, we were nine. We, have, we are a family of nine, so it's a big family. But uh, I grew up with four of my siblings. The others had grown up earlier before us. So I didn't interact a lot with the other, the other four. I interacted with the other four who grew up at the same time with me. Yes. So I, I went to a, a nearby school near our home. It was called Fadi Primary School, but it's spelled with a B, but in Kikuyu we, we, we pronounce B as F. So Fadi Primary School. And um, I grew, I was a small girl when I was growing up. <laughs> of course, everyone is a small girl, but I was particularly small. Those were days when many people used to repeat. And uh, for me, I didn't repeat in any of the classes. And so I was in classes with very big people sometimes. I was uh, a, a relatively bright student. I used to top my class most of the time. 
And so my, my, my stay in the school was quite enjoyable generally because um, teachers seemed to really kind of favor students who are, who are doing well. Uh, in, when we did KCSE, I mean KCPE, the Kenya Certificate of Primary Education, I was top. I, I was the top. I was the top student, and so I was admitted to a national school uh, called Loreto Limuru, Loreto High School Limuru, which was uh, one of the top schools at the time, national schools. And I spent my four years there. Uh, of course, there there was more competition than I ever I ever had in in high school because uh, people came from different backgrounds. They were top in their schools. And so there was quite a bit more competition, but I also still did very well in, uh, as, as I went through the, the studies. And I, I passed well enough to go to, to the university. And so I was admitted to, uh, at Moi University. I was admitted to do uh, BSc in environmental health, which equates to public health. We were the pioneers of the program, uh, uh, the environmental health, I mean the BSc in environmental health. When I was growing up, <laughs> my mom always impressed on me that one day I'll be a judge, probably based on how she saw me thinking or uh, arguing things or, or uh, deciding things or also because we were, as a family, we were involved in, in a long court case that I, <laughs> I experienced that the whole of my childhood, like for 20 years, we were involved in a court case on uh, regarding land. And um, so probably because of that exposure for her with court issues, she thought then maybe how she had observed the judges making judgments and all that, she thought I would become a judge. But then um, other people thought I would become a doctor. And of course, that's what many people, when you're growing up, people want you to be what they think you should become. And so many people often told me, oh, oh, one boy, then I was called, I mean, now you call me Liz, but when I go home, they call me one boy. And uh, they were always like, one boy, you'll be a doctor, all that. Um, so when I, I was admitted to Moi University, I, the course was sounded close to medicine in a way, because it's public health. Just so in actually, I was in the town campus in Moi University, where we were, we were the, with the medical students. So the, for, the first two, for the first year, we actually attended the same classes with doctors. So we did the same things, but we split in second year when they did their, their other courses and we now started specializing in courses in our field. Yeah, so I, I finished the, the course, the, BF, the BSc uh, course in Moi University. And then I, I came, I, I, I graduated and I started looking for a job, but then I, I realized that it was very hard to get a substantive job without a master's. And I, whenever I looked for a job, I saw the adverts indicated that they wanted someone with a master's of public health. And I realized I cannot waste any time. I went back to university the following year and went to do Masters of Public Health in the same university. And, um, and so, yes, I got Masters of Public Health. And then after I, I finished, I got a job and I, I, after some years, I went back to the university and I did PhD in Public Health, specializing in nutrition. And that's how I started working on issues of nutrition. As I was growing up, I knew some people who are in science, but there could have been some influence then, but uh, I was more influenced when I went to the university. So when I was growing up, I used to see someone like uh, uh, Wangare Madai and the work she was doing, and that was interesting. 
as I grew up, I, when I was maybe a teenager, adolescent teenager, when I was in high school or when I had just finished, I remember some people telling me, oh, Wambu, you'll be like Wangari Madai, a kind of thing. I don't know, for some reason, there was that kind of association at some point. Uh, um, you, if I mean, I, probably they, they saw something that resembled. Um, but when I went to the university is when I actually got interest in science, really. And uh, I know I was good in science study. I mean, the, in sciences, uh, when I was in like primary school, I did very well in science. But um, when I went to universities, when I got that interest, uh, as I said, I was admitted to do BSc in environmental health. The, 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 the program the, at more university town campus, they used a different approach to teaching and it was called self-directed learning. And in self-directed learning, we were expected to do a lot of, um, a lot of work by ourselves. We do a lot of research, desk review, you go to the library, you, you look for information, you go to computers, you look for information for yourself, you teach yourself, then you meet as students in a group facilitated by a lecturer, you discuss what you have found. So the, it was very research oriented kind of study. And uh, within the program was also something we called com community-based education system. In, uh, in, sec in that year, we were meant to go to, to a community for six weeks you stay there in the community, you stay with them, you learn their, their life, what they are doing, the social issues, the health issues, and you do research on that. So you interact with them, you help them in the community about their health issues that they were experiencing, but at the end of the day, you do a research report. So that really exposed me to research. And then uh, in fourth year, uh, we were expected to do now a, 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 a a formal research where you actually start with uh, de deriving a protocol and then you go to the field and collect data systematically and then you analyze that data and you, 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 re you document it, you report it. And so in fourth year I did a research which I was assessing the, the quality of water uh, slum dwellers in Lang Langas in Eldoret were using. And so that all that exposure really gave me a lot of exposure to research. But during that time when I was a student, I also worked with professors in the university in their studies. They were, they were funded to do some studies. Like I remember when I was, I think it was in third year, I worked with a professor who was doing some work on quality of, quality of life. For, it was a w, World Health Organization kind of study and they, they, they were establishing the quality of life of people. And so I was involved in collecting data with people. And uh, at some point I was also involved in analyzing data with uh, one of the professors. Yeah, so for me, the exposure was especially during my undergraduate studies. And that's when I got interested in epidemiology because the people I, I worked with, some, several of them were epidemiologists. And I really, I, I got interest in epidemiology. And so when I, I thought of what I should study for my master's, I wanted to do something that relates to epidemiology. And epidemiology is the study of uh, disease distribution. So, um, so you study diseases and how they are distributed within the community. You know who is more affected and all that and what are the factors that affect uh, the distribution of the disease. And so when I went, I wanted to choose for masters, I, I went to do masters of public health because as I told you, as I looked for jobs all everywhere, I was just seeing master, you, you need to have masters of public health. But then I specialized in epidemiology and disease control. Yeah, so generally that's how I got interested in, in science. But then, I, I mean, the story is long because I can talk more about how I really now got involved. I would say that I'm a career mentee kind of thing. 
I have been mentored so many times through my 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 life, my my journey in my career. Um, but let me say more formally, from the time I I I went, I got my first job. So I got my first job at uh, the African Population and Health Research Center (APHRC), and um, the uh, I was. I was uh, I got the job as a research trainee. So the research traineeship program was a mentorship program where people who had just done masters were were mentored into PhD like they were prepared for PhD studies and so during that time I was mentored by several people who are at APHRC towards gaining good skills in in research which would all would help me to to get a placement for phd and to be a successful phd student then i got a, a doctoral fellowship uh, to study phd in um, in at the university of the vet waters Rand in south africa and um, i that was i mean i was mentored because when you're doing a, a, a a, a doctoral program, you get supervisors, and they were also mentors for me. So that was kind of also a mentorship uh, where I went through the, the studies. And then after my PhD, I came back to APHRC as a postdoc, postdoctoral research scientist. And that's also a mentorship program. So I, I got the postdoctoral fellowship at APHRC, but also I got a fellowship with the Wellcome Trust. Also, it's a it's a postdoctoral, so which now paid for my time at APHRC during my postdoctoral fellowship. And so being a fellowship, I was assigned mentors. Uh, so I had mentors uh, two from 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 uh, from the UK uh, who are my sponsors through the Welcome Trust Fellowship. I had one from South Africa who was my my doctoral mentor, and then. I had a mentor from APHRC who was my supervisor. So I really had all those mentors and I got through all that mentorship. And um, I, 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 I have also just finished a fellow, uh, another fellowship after that uh, mentorship. After that mentorship, then I, I have grown to, to become a senior research scientist at APHRC. But uh, more recently, I got another fellowship, and this is different. It's not a research fellowship. It was a public engagement fellowship with the Wellcome Trust. And um, this was also a mentorship kind of program to become a public engagement ambassador, and which has opened my space. So as a researcher, I, of course, you're meant to really engage the public, the policymakers, and everyone. But that really opened up for me the space for engagement, and it was a mentorship program. Through that, I was allowed to have a coach. Then maybe it changed more from mentor, mentor, but to coach. Who um, so I had two coaches during this fellowship, and one was a communications coach who coached me on communications to be able to communicate my work, science, any communication. Uh, appropriate, uh, appropriately and effectively. I also had another coach who was a career coach or yeah, a leadership coach just to mentor me through leadership. Oh, yeah, mainly through leadership. I mentor a lot. I have been mentoring a lot. I supervise students from, let me say from past as a, as a supervisor. I have supervised several students at master's level, at PhD level, and so several students have gone through my hands and I mentor them. And also at APHRC, I mentor a lot of junior researchers, early career researchers who need uh, my, my mentorship. So um, one of the things when I have done assessments, there are some assessments we do at APHRC, leadership assessments and all that. One of the things that have come up strongly is that I do well in mentorship, and I am really, uh, I'm really keen on mentorship because I have really been mentored myself. 
as I said, I'm a career mentee. I, all through my journey, I've been mentored, and I really want to pass it on to others. And so at APHRC, in my unit, which I had, I had the maternal and child well-being unit. We have established a mentorship program so uh, to mentor junior researchers, but uh, so to, uh, towards uh, research excellence and also towards their further studies and career progression. So generally, I mentor a lot. I think there are a lot of opportunities. First, starting with research opportunities, a lot of things that people can study in. And um, so they can get involved in research. And as you have seen my career path, I started um, being a research trainee and I have progressed to being a senior research scientist. And for me, the journey has been great with a lot of learnings along the way. Um, so for, for me, research is a good path for, for young graduates in science. Uh, because you learn a lot through research, you learn a lot, you get exposed to a lot of things, you get exposed to a lot of information, evidence, and you learn so much. And then you also get opportunities to engage, engage the public, engage policymakers. So it's really a good career to take. But there are also opportunities in programming, like working with uh, maybe the government or the non governmental organizations, implementing organizations. To implement, uh, to implement programs. And then there is also the, the track of getting into policy, like working with governments, like it could be Ministry of Health, to really uh, work to, to formulate policies. Yes, uh, so the, 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 there are a lot of opportunities. Of course, in Kenya, for example, especially, um, job opportunities are a, a problem. I, I meet, I mean, many people interact with me, like through Twitter, they tell me they have been looking for a job for two years and they have not gotten a job. And they, they, they so I, I know one who, who told me he got a, a first class in his university and he's still tamaking, he's still looking for a job. So it's not easy. And as I told you, when I grew, I mean, when I finished my undergraduate studies, I, 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 I looked for a job for that, during that one year that I, I stayed out and I realized I could not, I could not just um, wait anymore. I had to add to my, to top up my skills and my papers for me to get a substantive job. So I realized with one degree, it's difficult. It was difficult for me to get a substantive job and I had to go back to, to school and top it up so that I could stand out. Yeah, so there are all those difficulties, but there are opportunities. They are always there. Okay, if I call my career path starting from when I was a student, like, um, let me say, when I was doing my undergraduate studies, as, uh, uh, as, uh, as, I, as I said, I did my a study when I was in fourth year, a research, uh, the, a research project. When I did my proposal, I, I wanted to do something that makes a difference. And I wanted, so I, I had a friend in, a, in an urban poor setting, that is Langas in Eldoret, that is a slum setting. And I used to visit them and I used to kind of observe the kind of water they were using. The water was, was, a, was from a, a shallow well and just next to the shallow well were pit latrines. And I was concerned about the kind of water they are using. And I really wanted to study that. So when I, when I, I was given the opportunity to do a research project, I wanted to do a research project where I would take water samples and take them to the lab and uh, evaluate whether they are safe, the water is safe for human consumption, to check for fecal coliforms and all those kind of things. But then funding was a problem. Um, I remember waiting for several weeks, looking for a, a way to really be able to do that kind of study. And, um, some students were like, why are you struggling so much? Why don't you just do something simple, you know? Like 
something you can do i some some of them say some people even do this under trees so you don't have to struggle so much but i really wanted to make to do something that makes a difference but in that waiting and uh, looking i was very lucky to get some support i i was given support by amref i re- i learned they were also looking for opportunity for someone who would be able to establish the quality of water that the slum dwellers were using they had a project in in Eldoret and were, they were they were their their project was to promote safe water like uh, water through water kiosks tapped water through water kiosks but they needed evidence of what the situation of water in the in the community and so then our interests met and i got funding through them to do the study and i completed the study and it was published i mean i i got to publish it when i came to aphrc and the same thing happened when i was doing my ap my masters same issue of funding but somehow i got funding with for my masters i got funding through the care international through their refugee assistance program i also stayed for a long time before i could really make a, a breakthrough for funding but i got the funding i got i worked with them as a volunteer and they supported my work when i have been at phrc as a researcher some of the challenges are are um, so you have they say you publish or perish and so publishing work uh, being able to publish work getting grants to be able to have projects is very critical for a researcher and sometimes getting grants is really difficult so sometimes you a lot of times you get a regret when you have applied for a grant also when you submit paper sometimes you get negative re- response you get a regret or rejections so those are the lows but there are so many highs in this career i have i mean of course when you get those um, those papers published when you get the the grants to do the work you you get success in grants that's a happy moment but more so when you see you are making a difference in people's lives so for me making a feeling the feeling that i'm making a difference in people's lives has been my high point i have been able there through the research that i have done i've been able to inform policies and programming in kenya and uh, also to inform uh, across africa i mean uh, we do research across africa although most of our, my work has been in kenya and east eastern east and southern african region but yes uh, so my highest moment is when i know the work i'm doing is influencing lives it's transforming lives okay when when i went to the university to do the bachelor's of science in environmental health i i kind of did not feel very happy i didn't feel that that's what i wanted to do at the time the only thing that made me happy it was because it was close to medicine and so uh because I, as i told you as i was growing up there was there was that jug uh, uh thinking around doing medicine and um so when i when i when i was admitted i kind of felt a bit negative but then i got excited also because it was in a good campus the town campus where we were working we were with the medical students and it was removed from the main campus where so the the kind of life in the town campus was a good life so i did um but then when we continued i we were the pioneers in the program the environmental health program and i kind of along the way i started wondering why did i accept to take this course because it was we we did not get um the the kind of tra- training that i was expecting in a university the kind of mentorship i did not feel that i got it well or we got it well as a class we even went on strike at some point uh, alleging we don't have good uh training the the training we were getting was not adequate 
and uh, so some of the sometimes I, I I kind of thought I could have um, I could have looked for something else at the time when I accepted to do the degree in BSc Environmental Health I could have opted for something else I could have looked for opportunity but I did not do that so I felt uh, through those four years I felt like I was doing the wrong thing and um, kind of um, uh, kind of sometimes regretted why I didn't think of changing but I can say all that ends well is well so after all this it's been all successful so I think I I'm okay at, at, at this point I I wouldn't say I regret anymore like um, at that point I regretted why I didn't change I didn't look for opportunities to change and do something else but now I think it's um, all that ends well is well. I, I think what I could tell myself if I was to go then is to actually be proactive in deciding what you want and look out for that opportunity. So I just um, complied, kind of, I accepted what I was given because I had not applied for this course, actually, because it wasn't in existence at the time we were in, the, in high school. Uh, so it was something that was new, and so I just accepted to do it. But now, I mean, if I was to advise someone, I would tell them, look, be proactive, fight for what you want if it, until you can't get it, but at least do attempt. Okay, so as I said, I have been doing a lot of research in uh, maternal and child nutrition. That has been my main focus when I have been at APHRC. I have done um, especially a lot of research in, um, in Kenya, uh, amongst the urban poor particularly, but also in other settings, in rural settings. And uh, I have been, first I have been trying to identify, I mean, to establish the situation of nutritional status amongst women and children. But then are also looking out for strategies, doing research on strategies to optimize their well-being, to, to optimize nutrition for women and children. And through the research, I have been able to inform several policies that are related to that. For example, the Baby Friendly Community Initiative. I, I spearheaded the research that was done to inform the, the guidelines that were published in 2016. I have also been on uh, 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 working to, to inform other strategies, like the workplace support for breastfeeding guidelines. I have done research that has informed that. And the other, the one, one of the latest is the is the uh, human milk banking. You may have heard about the human milk bank at Umwani a maternity hospital. So we've been doing research behind that bank. And so, um, so how I have influenced the society is uh, really around just being able to find strategies and informing policy and programming around maternal and child nutrition has been, I mean, it's what I have contributed most to the society. And uh, through my research, I have realized that one of the, one of the drivers of poor, poor nutrition is actually food, the issue of food. And many women, for example, have told us the reason why we do not op op optimally breastfeed, the reason why we don't feed our children optimally is because we do not have food. So we have like in urban poor settings, they say we have to, we don't have food. So we can't, it's difficult for us to breastfeed optimally when ourselves we are hungry. And some of them say we, we have to go look for, for work to be able to, ha to have food in the household. So we can't just stay back and just breastfeed the child. When you talk about exclusive breastfeeding, because the mother needs to be breastfeed the child exclusively for the first six months, according to the World Health Organization guidelines. So those are, so I have realized that food is really very important and have started working to research on that, to do research on that and to really find 
opportunities to optimize food security in communities and particularly in urban poor settings. And so my current work is really focused on integrating nutrition specific and nutrition sensitive interventions. Nutrition specific being interventions like nutritional counseling to, to, to advise like mothers on how to breastfeed optimally, how to feed their children optimally. Then nutrition sensitive being looking around, looking at other interventions that would, uh, would, 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 um, would promote breastfeeding. They are not the immediate, but they are, they, they, are, uh, we, they are within the underlying factors like food security. So promoting food security would impact on, on nutrition. So we, we can't just tell mothers to breastfeed and breastfeed optimally if they are they have no food in the household. So I have now started looking into that space. Advantages is really the opportunity to change lives, uh, to, to, impl to influence policy, to influence programming and to change lives of people. For me, that's, as I said, is one of the, the things that make me happy when I think about my work, my research, because when you do research, you inform you inform change. So informing change in policy, in programming, and transforming people's lives is one of my greatest advantages. Um, of course, I came at a time when there is this whole thing about gender, promoting gender equality. And uh, so whenever like there are opportunities, they often encourage women. So in I, 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 I know that whenever I have applied for opportunities, I may have been lucky that uh, there is this whole idea of equality. And uh, so women are considered uh, and they are encouraged to apply for these opportunities and have, have been able to get many opportunities. And a disadvantage as of being a woman in science, we have many responsibilities. We have a lot of responsibilities in the reproductive space. At home, we have the responsibility as a mother, taking care of your children, many things around that. Being a wife, it has also its own, a lot of responsibilities. But then at the end of the day, you still have to do your work as a scientist. So we have to juggle between uh, this research work and, and uh, the work uh, at, at home, the, the reproductive space. So like when I was doing my PhD, okay, so I, I told you I came to APHRC as a research trainee and were given two years to be able to get a a place for PhD and go for PhD, so two to three years. So, um, so at, at my third year, I was now determined I need to go for, for I, I need to get a PhD placement. And as we many of us know, studying, doing PhD like here in Kenya is very difficult. And I didn't want to, to, to do my PhD here in Kenya because I didn't want to spend too much time waiting to be to finish i have had so many people talk of those challenges and so i i want i wanted to go outside of the country we hoped that we could get opportunities where where we could go as a family but that those are not easy and so i had to leave my family behind my child was two years and something some months two years and a few months and I had also to leave my husband behind. So I had to go on uh, and combine the two. So I, I knew when I went, I knew I had to finish this PhD within record time, at most three years. But uh, so, and then when I was doing the PhD, my, my supervisors were very understanding and they allowed me to, to juggle between my, my responsibilities as a mother, as a wife, and as some, as some as a, family member with the, the work I was doing for the PhD. And so I used to stay in South Africa for three years, 
I came to Kenya for two years. That was my life. So I had to come and go, come and go. And that was my life. And of course, we had to keep in touch with my husband so that I, I can, we can talk and also talk to the child and all that. But yes, those are some of the disadvantages that you, you are a mother. I mean, many times you, as a woman, in science, you are a mother and a wife and also the scientist. And you have to juggle between all those. And so that, for me, is one of the difficult parts. Of course, even today, as I try to progress, there are all those responsibilities that I still have to balance. I'm very keen on promoting justice. That is um, on top of my table now. And um, I am very, I, I'm very keen on human rights. I'm passionate about particular right to food. I really want to promote the right to food. I want to, um, to, to, end, I want to see everyone access food. And so um, I have entered into that space of, uh, of human rights and promoting justice, promoting the right to food, and. Um, as we speak now, the, the current move is to really work, I mean, advocate for change of, have a paradigm shift, change mindsets around the narrative about food. Food has been commodified so much that it's now just a commodity and many people who do not have money have no, have no food. Because if you don't have money, you don't have food because many times you have to buy food and i i want to drive some narrative change around the commodification of food and recommodification of food making food be considered so we know that food is a human right as indicated i mean as recognized in the universal declaration of human rights and also in the international conventions um which we are party to in Kenya, we have, and many other countries are party to those, uh, to the conventions. It is constitutionalized in our constitution. We have a right to food and it's constitutionalized in many other countries. But many people sleep hungry. Like you had in this, during this COVID time, you heard of that woman who was cooking stones for, for her children. Really, that is not, that should not happen in a context where we recognize food as a human right. Nobody should have to sleep hungry. Nobody should have to cook stones for their children. So I really want to drive that narrative change. I want to, I'm, I'm driving a change towards having a universal food access policy so that people can be supported to, to be able to, to produce their own food and for those who are not able to produce their own food, they are supported to, to be able to access the food. So uh, creating the, the right environment that people can be able to, to access food. Uh, also recognizing food as a public good in which sense uh, and as a human right, where the government has responsibility. If people do not have food from production and, and they are not able to purchase food, they are vulnerable. Then the government takes responsibility to ensure that everyone can feed. So I saw yesterday there was this uh, budget that was was allocated to to food security, which is a good move. Uh, 60, 60 billion. That is a good move. We want more of that. We want really more of that, and to ensure that we have like safety nets, social protection, so that the most vulnerable like that woman who was cooking stones for her children. She can get support so that she can be able to have food for herself and her children. So really that's my, my next fight. I want to, to, to lead the, the fight against hunger to, to, to zero hunger by 2030. That's my fight at the moment. I really want to be in that fight and to be a leader in that fight against hunger towards zero hunger by 2030 in line with the sustainable development goal number two. Actually, just to add to the 
to the fight, uh, I mean, to the promotion of justice, to building this legacy of justice, I went back to school. I, I actually went back to school to study law and um, uh, particularly interested in human rights law. And uh, so currently I'm a lawyer also. And uh, yeah, so that's where I am. And I hope that uh, I can I can lead uh, justice promotion. I don't have my personal my personal experience with the issue of mental health, but of course, if you did assessments on mental health using the tools that I used, you may find that even those people who do not think they have a mental health issue may actually have a mental health issue. But I, I, I haven't had any mental health issue that has been identified. But I have interacted with people with mental health issues. I have I work amongst very vulnerable people and uh, communities, and uh, who are juggling with very basic issues, very basic issues. The issue of food, the issue of not sleeping hungry, like or the issue of sleeping hungry several days. So I maybe I can give an example of a friend that I had when I was in, in Moi University. I, as I mentioned, I had a friend in, in, the, in Langa's slum in Eldoret. I used to visit her and her family. They lived in Langa's. She had two children and um, she, she was living in real poverty. And whenever I visited them, sometimes they didn't have anything to eat. Sometimes I took food to them. They sometimes they didn't have anything. When I, sometimes when I went to them, they, they kind of warmed some water and um, put some tea leaves and they couldn't even warm it adequately because that means fuel. So they just warmed it, they didn't boil it. So sometimes I feared actually taking that tea. So it was just tea, water and water and that black, it was black tea. And as I took it, I mean, it was really uh, real poverty, if I may say. And um, the driver for that, she, this lady lived in some good lives before. She was married, but then she separated with her husband. And then she lost her job. She used to work and she lost her job. She kind of went into abject poverty, this real poverty after living a good life before. And so this was really stressful for her. She had bouts of mental illness. She used to actually go like what people say, go nuts. Like sometimes you find her on the streets and she, at that point, she has lost it completely. And she was taken to medical, I mean, mental hospital. There was a mental hospital in at Moi Teaching and Referral Hospital. There was also a mental hospital there. And several times she used to be taken in there and stay there for several weeks because she went, um, she had a problem. So that was my Okay, it's not, maybe it wasn't my inter first interaction with people with mental health, but that went deep. So this whole issue of struggling to find food, struggling to really just take care of her children, really made her go to that depth of mental illness. More recently, I, there is also another lady that I know who lives in Kibera. She, she during this COVID-19 period, she kind of also went nuts, if I may use that term, nuts. But um, what I mean is that she got that mental health problem. And this is, has been a very difficult time because people have really struggled with food. With, with, they have lost jobs. They, people who, who work these casual jobs, it has been a very, very difficult Time. So that person I know personally who was known started like having those problems. It's the son who, who, wrote, who called me and told me the mother seems to be to have a problem. And uh, 
wanted me to give them some money and some several times asking for food and all those kind of things so but these are not this is not an isolated case we were we have done some research in the in Korogosho and Rwanda in the slums of Nairobi here about the impact of of covid-19 government response measures on human rights and particularly the right to food and and food security and what they have said that this period has been very very difficult and the response measures were did not consider their needs they, they were not they were not cognizant of their needs they were not uh, they didn't they were not aligned to their human rights and many people of course are hungry many people are very hungry people have lost jobs they don't have money for food and they have said that this has resulted to a lot of uh, mental health issues a lot of fights within families people a lot of gender based violence because now people are people have come from everyone from their productive space now they are all in this reproductive space the woman the wife and the husband are together and there are a lot of struggles so this whole it has resulted in in a lot of this uh, um and uh, fights in families and uh, but also just the fact that people do not have jobs and have don't have food has also resulted to mental health issues so that's i can say i mean of course that's not my only experience with mental health issues but that's uh, that's that's what i can say for now Okay um so volunteer work I I volunteered as I said when I was doing my masters I was looking for an opportunity also to to get to to fund my study so I was I wanted to do mass um, my study amongst the refugees and I wanted to find ways of um, controlling malaria for them malaria that time I was interested in malaria and um so i got a volunteer opportunity with the care international so i went to dadab refugee camps and i stayed there for several months six months i conducted my research uh during that period and um, so i i was a volunteer so i was working with the, within their programs as a volunteer i also volunteered to, to do teaching practice in the in the refugee schools so i was also a teacher i used to teach biology and um for me probably all those things come together like when you have you 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 your cv when you you put there were times when that was the most important thing in my cv like when i was looking for a job at phrc there was no other of course i did those other jobs that i told you i, I used to do some contracts with the professors i mean some some research with professors i also did some 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 contract with uh, when i when i was tamaking when i was looking for a job in the year that i went back to the university i did some small jobs here and there doing research and all that but that volunteer job was an important one it is one of the substantive jobs that i had done before i got the job in aphrc but i also did an internship with the with the with the ministry of health for one year before i got my job at aphrc it was not paid it was a free kind it was like a volunteer kind of internship and uh, so all those two those two opportunities gave me an i mean exposed me to work even if not paid uh, at 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 inter, uh, care international I was being given a stipend so it wasn't too bad but um it was still voluntary so i would i, I mean we we at phrc we we have internship programs we don't call them volunteer programs we call them internship programs in the past we've not been paying for anything we have just been uh, giving people opportunity to come for 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 internship it's an opportunity to start working and many people who came as interns 
got their way through a job at APHRC when opportunities became available. Um, but more recently, we have decided to formalize those internships and we are giving a small stipend. And right, right now, for example, in my unit, my, the, the unit that I lead, we are admitting four interns uh, whom we are going to stay with for three to six months. We give them a small stipend. We work with them in the projects that we work in for them to get exposure to research, to work. So that, that also gives them an opportunity for work. I know how difficult it is to get a job in Kenya, really difficult. As I said, I, I tarmacked that one year and I knew what it was. So I really also want to give people opportunity for, for exposure to work even before they can get their substantive job. This promoting universal food access. And um, so, so you, we want to, to, to ensure that, I mean, to see everyone access food, whether you have money or you don't have money. So we want to really help in the conceptualization of food so that food is seen as a human, a basic human need and a basic human right that everyone should be entitled. And um, I, have, I, have been, I, I have been co-opted as a co-lead in uh, there is this UN, UN summit that is coming up in September. And um, so the UN summit for food systems, it's a food systems summit. And we want to present this idea of this policy at the UN summit. I mean, it's, we want it to be presented, of course, at the UN summit. Now it's, it's the member states that are involved in that. But uh, we are now developing the idea and we want it adopted and, pre and, uh, and presented at the UN summit for adoption by member states. And we hope that that will be uh, adopted so that governments, states can consider food as, uh, fo um, uh, can consider having a policy for universal food access. We know about universal education, ed universal education like now here in Kenya, we know that every child has a right to education and the government has put in place measures to ensure free primary education and uh, free secondary education now. We also know about the universal health coverage. So we want food to be put in the same compact with universal education access and universal health coverage because food is so basic. Food is such a basic human need. It is, um, it is, it is a basic human right upon which all many other rights are based. Like they, they rely on on that right. Like the right, the right to life. You cannot talk of the right to life if you do not have food. Because if you don't have food, then it means you can't live long. You can't live any longer. I mean, of course, a few after a few days. If you don't, you are not eating, you may get sick and die. So really food is very basic and very important and we should, it should be put at that level and we hope that that will be adopted. So we are starting, uh, we want to start a movement here in Kenya to really facilitate that reconceptualization through our, so we have a vision for 2050 for Nairobi uh, which we want to promote food security, uh, starting with the urban poor in Kenya, but we want to really promote food security across the socioeconomic divide. We know well the, well the, the urban poor are struggling with just getting food to eat, just the food, just the food itself. People in other settings, even in the, in the top uh, up market are struggling with like quality of food safety of food, we want to really promote access to safe, nutritious food for all, starting with urban poor and also across the socioeconomic divide. So we really want to start a movement which promotes uh, universal food access and the right to food. And uh, we will be calling on everyone to join us, the public, policymakers, researchers, the media, everyone to join us in this 
movement and promote this. One, one advice I would want to give them is advice that I was given by my mother when I was very young. I mean, she always told me this. She always said in my language, if I could say it, um, in, in my language, she used to say, and when I, I, I translate that in, in English, is nothing good comes along easily. What, and she kept using that. And um, what that means is that for you to get something good or to succeed in something, you really have to work hard. It's not easy. You have to work hard. So she kind of inculcated that in me. And when all through my journeys, through all these journeys too, from when I was still a very young, when I was still in primary school, I had to work hard. I know I there are sometimes I, I burnt oil even when I was in primary school I remember when I was in working to really ensure that I get good grades that continued all through my high school my campus nothing good comes along easily I had to really continue working and encouraging myself and that also at my work when sometimes you have to work hard for that proposal to be successful it takes an effort it's not easy as a scientist. It's not easy. Nothing, nobody young men that it's easy. It is not easy. One has to work hard. But there is good reward. Work hard and you really put your effort in, you will get good results. So I always that is like that is like the advice I, I give to myself. I always use that to myself and I also give to other people. Do you want to start your own podcast? Start with some simple gear that you already have and a quiet space. Simple gear includes a microphone, editing software, and host of your podcast. Simple microphones include the ones on your phones and computers on a simple recorder, which you can upgrade later. For the editing software, I use Audacity, which is free and simple to use. Buzzsprout, which over a thousand other fellow podcasters like me use, is one of the podcast hosting providers you can use. Buzzsprout has helped me link my show on every major podcast platform with the endless number and regularly updated tutorials and good customer service support Buzzsprout offers, my podcasting journey has been made easy. Following the link in the show notes, let Buzzsprout know we sent you, gets you a $20 Amazon gift card if you sign up for a paid plan and helps support our show.